Well, I think we'll ignore that clock for a few seconds here. <laughs> And the service is going to begin. Thank you so much for being here this morning. A wonderful day that God has made. A day for us to rejoice and be glad. And a, do a day for us to join together as a church family. So thankful that each one of you is here today. We have a little bit of church business. Um, we had a wonderful celebration in Larry Swisher's backyard last weekend. And somebody left a chair. And Larry would like you to uh, come reclaim your chair at your convenience. So if you, if you go inventory your camp chairs and there's a missing one, please get a hold of Larry Swisher and go pick up your camp chair. Also, next Sabbath in the afternoon, we're going to have a memorial service for Bob Bradshaw. And many of you have known him over the years. I, he was always Uncle Bob to me because... Is part of our family. And so we miss him, but we are going to memorialize his life at 3 o'clock next Sabbath afternoon. Also, uh, some prayer requests for today. Up in British Columbia, we have friends and family that are facing wildfires, some evacuations, some uh, threatened loss of homes, possibly even lives. We need to keep them in our prayers. And Ted and Sigrid Kroner's son, Mike, is going in for a heart transplant operation tomorrow. And you need to keep him in your prayers, particularly this evening and tomorrow as he prepares and as the medical team prepares to do that job. We do have an offering this morning. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But as we come before God, we quite often have questions for him. And I've got a, a little poem this morning about a question that has lingered for a long time. It's called The Prayer. Our father, Adam, prayed this prayer when what he loved fell out of square, when those he loved, no longer there, brought from his lips this anguished prayer. The mothers in Egypt prayed this prayer when Pharaoh made their joy so spare, oh, how we rue what he started there. They cried and cried this anguished prayer. The prophets in Israel prayed this prayer when the priests and kings just didn't care. When Babylon's troops were climbing the stair, their hearts poured out this anguished prayer. The souls under the altar pray this prayer, because this world is so terribly unfair, they've been forced his sufferings to share, and so they cite this anguished prayer. How long, O oh Lord, till you end our choice? How long, O oh Lord, till you save our boys? How long, O oh Lord, till you forgive our vice? How long, O oh Lord, till you avenge our price? Seriously, Father, I've read your word through to know even though things are a little tough compared to the worst we've seen in the past, we're not even close to what you've described as the last. Still, we'd love to see you most any old time. Truth is, from Cain's first angry crime, all who have loved you awaited the time when love and truth sweeps away all this grime. How long then, O oh Lord, how long? Our offering this morning is to care for the expenses of our local congregation. If the deacons would please stand. Father, we do pray, how long? And yet you have asked us to stay here and represent you to this world. And part of the way we do that is through our local congregation. Father, we collect our offering this morning to support the ministry of what we do here to show people how much you love them. 
Be with us, bless us, and give us hearts to bless others. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship, invite you in to Sabbath rest, and hopefully share some things that will bring some delight to your heart today. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so privileged to come and worship with you today at this time and at this place with liberty to sit in your presence and know of your love. Lord, I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to us today to fill us with your purpose, with your desire, with your will, that we may be reflectors of you and your image to the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Our scripture this morning is found in Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And again, it's Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. If you turn your way, your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure, on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Well, happy Sabbath. We are here to worship together, and we want you guys all to stand so as we sing, Here I Am to Worship. Thank you.
because it reminds me of a very special friend of mine. And it was just, it was very nice to, to when I first heard it the first time, and it always reminds me of Gail. Just a um, very nice song, above all. Above all 
And I just wanted to welcome Rico. He's one of our youth um, from the Richland Church. And I'm just so glad because he actually picked all the songs for us. And it's so great to see our youth come and say, I'm willing to do this. So welcome, Rico. Thank you. And of course, there's another guy next to him. Yeah. He, he never says no to me. I, I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Brandon, you're special. And so are you, Rico. song just think about the words Jesus is everything you are my strength and I am weak you are the treasure that I seek you are my all in all when I am as a precious jewel what to give up I'd be a fool you are my there's like four different verses and I'll be a something for Jesus.
you guys way down there on the end you got to come in close because today's story is about something that's really close so find a seat as close as you can is this orange microphone on okay i'll get right into it you might want to turn it up a little bit row in case i don't get right in it thank you <clears throat> well we often tell a story about the baby jesus being born around Christmas time. Do you know we never ever, I don't think, ever talk about the baby Jesus and his mommy and their everyday lives. So you guys, we have a baby right up here. See the baby? Yeah. And every day, mommy takes good care of that baby. So I was imagining what Mary and Jesus, what their life would be like every day. Can you imagine on the first day of the week, you get up in the morning and you get some breakfast and they go and see the sunshine outside. And Mary says to Jesus, did you know that you made that sunshine on the first day of the week? Is that what Jesus made on the first day of the week when he made the world? Did he make light? He did, didn't he? And then the next morning they get up and they have a happy time together. And Mary says to Jesus, what did Jesus make on the second day of the week? Do you remember? Didn't he make the dry land? Yes, yes he separated the water from the land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He did make a lot of things. And each day would go by. And Mary would say to Jesus, today is the day that you made the animals. Today is the day that you made the trees and the flowers. Today you made the puppies? 
Yes. And today is the day that you made me, Mary would say, because Jesus made man on the sixth day, didn't he? Yes. We'll talk about that, okay? God's, God's time is different than our time, okay? But then on the seventh day, what did God make? What did God make through Jesus on the seventh day? You don't know? He made rest. Isn't that cool? We get to come to church on that day. We get to go home and spend time with family and friends. That's right. Today is the seventh day. God gives us everything we need, and Mary got to hold God in her arms. Ah, what, did, what happened on the sixth day? He made, he made us, right? But he also made the big animals. We talked about those things. Remember the puppy? The puppy, yeah, exactly. Yes, God made all of those things for us, and he made them through Jesus. And Mary got to tell the baby Jesus the story of what he had done. I don't know how Jesus grew up. I don't understand it. But I do know that he grew up to love us so much that he made something else for us. He made something you can take into your heart every day. He made salvation. That's right. Shall we have a quick prayer and thank him for that? You guys, let's fold our hands and close our eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for coming here and being that baby in Mary's arms and letting her tell the story of all the things that you made for us and then making one more thing that we can have forever. Thank you for that salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys. Lisa's got some things you can take back to your seat to look at during church. Good morning, dear Jesus. Good morning, dear Father. What a beautiful day when I learned that my Savior love for me, that transformed me. Let us believe in the Lord Jesus with all our hearts, and we shall be saved. Help us, O oh Lord, to be born again each day. Let us see Jesus on the cross for us. Let us be born again. Let us have love in our home, dear Father, dear Jesus. Help us if we have a fight. When one win, we both lose. Let us have love always in our homes. Let us have an attitude of thankfulness. See Jesus on the cross. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus. 
you have freed us from sin. We pray in the name of our dear Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's just bow our heads a moment. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I ask for your presence and that your grace and your words and your will will cover us today as we learn more about you and the gift of your Sabbath. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the topic today is a time to delight. And we're going to talk a little bit about the Sabbath. And when I decided on this topic, it was actually at the request of my son. So when I was studying Joshua and I was working on the sermons for Joshua, Spencer said to me, Mom, you should just, you should do a sermon on the Sabbath. I, I, I think you should just, I would really like you to do a sermon on the Sabbath. So Spencer, Here's the sermon on the Sabbath, and this isn't quite, when I started it, what I thought it would be. It kind of went somewhere that I didn't expect, just by some things that I learned and appreciated as I was studying. 
And it was actually fair for Spitzer to ask that because I have done a sermon on the Sabbath in this church, but it was before Spencer was born. And that was 16 years ago this month. So it's fair to revisit the topic because it's a big topic and we're not going to cover everything. And this isn't a sermon today about why it's the seventh day. This isn't a sermon about how the seventh day was changed. It's none of these things. It is a calling back to the meaning of the seventh day. And we're going to sit in kind of three main areas of scripture, and we're going to look at some parallels through those areas of scripture. And we're going to start in Isaiah. This actually has always been a favorite scripture of mine, even when I was young. So if you'll turn with me to Isaiah 58. It sounds so happy, and yet there's a depth of pain and sorrow behind it. So Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14, is kind of going to be the premise of where we're going to start. We're kind of starting in the middle. If you turn your foot away from the Sabbath. So when you, if you turn your, way, your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure, the better interpretation would be your business on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure, not speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. When we look at this scripture, right at the beginning, we see a couple things. We see an if you then you shall, and I will. You might call it a bit of a conditional promise, or better yet, you might call it an invitation back to a covenant relationship. Ezekiel 20, 20 says, Hollow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. In the first phrase, if you turn your foot away from the Sabbath, gives us echoes of another thing. It gives us echoes of a burning bush. Take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. It gives us is echoes of Joshua facing the commander, the Lord of hosts. Again, take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. Turn your way a foot from the Sabbath is basically a claim of this is holy ground. This is holy time. Turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, like I said, from doing your business. And it's not so much of what you're doing, it's that's that you're called not to do. Stop. Rest. Desist. That's the call. And call the Sabbath a delight. The Sabbath, in and of itself, to be a delight indicates relationship. The Sabbath was designated as holy. Holy time, holy ground. You could think of it as a sanctuary of time. The holy day of the Lord... It's not the holy day of you or me. It belongs to the Lord. So the Sabbath belongs to the Lord. It's his. It's his holy time. It's not ours. And if it's his holy time and we're trampling on that holy time with our business, we're stealing God's time. And then we get into the next part that says, and you shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. It's only when we honor the day according to the Lord's direction and for God's intended purpose that we can find delight in the Sabbath. To appreciate the full depth of delight, 
to appreciate the full depth of increasing delight, we have to dwell in the divine sanctuary of time. The Lord says, then, once you're there, once you're in my time, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. You're going to delight yourself in me. To delight in someone speaks of relationship. All right? Delight has dimensions to it. It's a grand word. It's a word that's used in lots of old literature. We don't use it much today, but it's a word full of meaning. It imparts feeling, joy, peace, harmony, anticipation. It invites seeking. When you delight in someone, you seek contact with them, conversation with them, connection with them, knowledge of them. It has a dimension of union. When you delight in somebody, man, they are so cool. I want to be like that. I want to be part of what they are. Union, thought, desire, plan, life. That is delight. It's dimensional. It's a relationship that invites inspires growth, service, and the promise of continued and future delight. In the book from a secular author called Hold On To Your Kids, the author is Gaber Mate, and he does a lot of writing on attachment and the breakdown of attachment between children and parents. He stresses the importance of delight in the child-parent relationship. That for healthy, true attachment, and to be a healthy individual, spiritually, psychologically, and physically, you need to have a healthy attachment with your parent and with your child. And he says it is important for parents to delight in their children. And that reciprocates children delighting in their parents. It's a form of connection. He's not even a believer, and he gets the importance of delight in a relationship. So once we're delighting and we're back in that relationship with the Lord... And then he says, and I will. I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth. We're riding. We're not walking to the high hills. We're not hiking to the high hills. We're not climbing the high hills. We're riding. It indicates rest, right? It's a conveyance. It's a carrying. God's doing the work. I will cause you to ride. And he says, I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. To feed, to be nourished, to be provided for, to be prepared for, to be served. With the heritage of Jacob. God's doing the work, not us. Our part was just to rest. To show up in the divine time. Jacob's heritage, I'm not going to give you all the scriptures. I'm just going to give you a quick review and synopsis. Jacob's heritage included such things as holiness of character, superior intellect, health, skill and craftsmanship in agriculture and as in little husbandry, in prosperity and national greatness. Isaiah, in this passage, was calling the children of Israel to revival. He was calling them to reformation through repair and restoration of their physical and spiritual foundations. If you look at the verse preceding, it says, Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repair of the breach, the restore of streets to dwell in. You're going to do those things if, and here it goes, you turn your foot away from the Sabbath. Then you will call my Sabbath a delight, and you will delight in me. The repair and restoration of the Sabbath was the beginning of the revival. It was also the sustaining momentum to restoration. 
and it is the eternal cycle of worship for all flesh in heaven and earth. We're sitting here in Isaiah. We see that there has been a problem with the Sabbath because we're being called to revival. And we can trace back the threads through scripture of the Sabbath back, and we can trace them forward. As we look forward, if you turn over to Isaiah 66, it's good to know where we're going to end up. Isaiah 66, verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and one from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. The Sabbath is not going anywhere. It's present now and through all eternity. So if Isaiah is sounding the trumpet, which is what it says at the very beginning of this passage, we can assume, and we already know that much has gone wrong with destruction and trampling that has transpired in regards to the Sabbath. If we're going to restore a historical building or you're going to repair an ancient painting, the more knowledge you have in regards to the original becomes essential to the process. If you have the blueprints of how that building was actually built, what it was made of, the fabrics that were used, the actual windows, if you know what's happened through the years of what was changed and altered, what was added on and what was taken away, it gives you a better understanding, a better perspective of how to restore it back to its original creation, its original intent. So we're going to go back to the beginning. We're going to go back to Sabbath at creation, the original Sabbath intent. And so if you turn with me to Genesis 2, we're going to spend some time here. But I'm going to stop you just for a moment because I want to give you a little bit of a framework before we get back to Sabbath at creation, Sabbath in its original form. Remember I said we're starting in Isaiah and we can trace the threads forward of Sabbath and we can trace the threads backwards of Sabbath. Isaiah in itself is a book that is kind of an overview of scripture in its entirety. And as we walk backwards in Isaiah, we can see that Sabbath in Isaiah 56 was an inclusion of all humanity. There was an exclusion of no one. All races, all genders, all nationalities. It was an invitation to everyone. We can go back to Deuteronomy where we see the commandments of the Sabbath outlined because the children of Israel were so enslaved, they had lost the whole concept of Sabbath and the whole understanding of Sabbath that the Lord's like spelling it out in fine detail. And we see there that the Sabbath represents a redeemer and a liberator. If you go back to Exodus 20, we see the Sabbath linked to the creator. If you go back even further in Exodus, before God's actually spelled it out to them on Mount Sinai, hey, this is what it's all about, we see him trying to re-engage them, re-rest them, re-feed them, re-show them what the Sabbath was all about. And we see it through the use of manna where he feeds them and supports them just like he said, I will feed you on the heritage of Jacob, right? And he rests them on the Sabbath day and they're having trouble getting it. In Ezekiel, God talks about the Sabbath as a sign of his people. He says, I am the Lord that sanctifies you. All of these details in through the picture and the narrative of the Old Testament was because what the original plan was at creation got warped and broken with fall, the fall. And then, so Sabbath went from what it was to adding things like redemption and restoration and recreation and salvation. 
God trying to bring his people back, to reconnect them, to reattach them with himself. So we turn to Genesis 2, 1 through 3, and we talk about the first Sabbath. There's some, there's some points that we need to appreciate. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. God finished, God worked, God rested. It's not saying anything about what Adam and Eve did, and it's because they hadn't done anything yet. Sabbath was the culminating event of creation. It was the final creation in this creation of a holy time. It was a pinnacle, in a sense, to a certain extent, to all correct creation. And almost in a sense, all creation was in preparation for this grand sanctuary of time where God would dwell with his presence in communion with man. Creation in and of itself, the creation story, is a, written in a poetic form. It's called a chiasm, where the sides on each side match up into this triangle, to this pinnacle of the seventh day. And if we go back for a second, as Dave shared with our children, in the beginning, God created light day one, right? But over on day four, at the other part, bottom part of the chiasm, he defined that light a little bit more, and he made it into the sun and the moon and the stars, right? And then day two, he separated the waters from the earth, and he made land and the heavens, all right? And on day, um, and then we go to, <laughs> keep this going. and on day three, the waters in the earth, and on day three, he had the waters gathered together in a place. So on day four, what did he do with the earth? We have this land. Well, he planted it. He added the seeds. He added the fruits. He added the vegetation. And then on day five, well, remember he had separated. We had the land of the sea, so now we fill it with birds. We fill it with fish. And on day six, we create all of the rest of our creatures and mankind. It was a chiasmic buildup, right? It was a chiasmic buildup to this event where God said, I'm done, I'm finished, and I'm resting. And I'm resting with my creation. And I'm resting in relationship to my creation. It almost reminds me a little bit of what we do today when we're planning for a grand event. If you take a wedding or you take a graduation, we make a place where we're going to hold it. Right? We set a time. We add lighting and maybe some good music and sometimes maybe in a wedding, you'll see birds or you'll see doves. In our wedding, we had the dog, all right? All right? And you have to have the people, all right? And all that, all right, comes together. You're preparing. You've got to add some flowers and some vegetation if you're going to really make the event look good, right, to the event that you're celebrating. And then you're like, oh, it's all done. It's perfect. And we're here just to enjoy and rest and enter into relationship and discussion with those that are with us, right? It's that same principle, all right, that God was building for. So God created. It was his voice, his plan. It's his honor, and it's his rest, The Sabbath day is a divine rest. God ended his work, he finished it, and he rested on the seventh day. It's an expression of his love. God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. It was a holy time set apart forever. 
Tonstad, in the book, The Last, Lost Meaning of the Seventh-day Sabbath, says it this way. By the act of hallowing the seventh day, God drives the stake of the divine presence into the soil of human time. Beautifully said. By the act of hallowing the seventh day, God drives the stake of the divine presence into the soil of human time. God created human, he created human time, and now he is present in it forever. He brought his presence and he infused it eternally into the Sabbath, creating for humanity a divine appointment to be kept in the sanctuary of time. Sabbath every day is a divine appointment. It's there, that appointment is there, whether you remember it's there, whether you're late to it, or whether you neglect it altogether. Sabbath shows the intimacy of God. God rested, God Sabbathed with his created beings in relationship. God is still Sabbathing every Sabbath, whether we are Sabbathing or not. Sabbath is eternally linked with the beginning of human history. Sabbath at creation was experienced and participated in light of the relationship of trust and faith in the creator as the life giver and the sustainer. Without it ever being said, Adam and Eve were participating in Sabbath in covenant relationship. It didn't have to be spelled out. Sabbath is more an expose of the character of God. And it was to be a continual revealing of his love. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we talk about the creation of man. He's created the world. He's setting up the premise. He's getting ready for the big day, the big event. And he's creating man. And Sabbath, to us, grounds us in our identity. We are a world screaming out for identity. And we're trying on all sorts of identity that we're never meant to be. So let's talk about what our identity is. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. It's helpful to understand that the word God in the Hebrew is Elohim and is actually plural. And there's no word in the English language to fit it. God, that's why it says God, let's make man in our image. Is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's God. They're going to make man in our image, in our likeness. Let them have, this is the plan for us, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God as dominion over all of us and king takes the role of servant. We see that in the life of Christ. To have dominion over the earth was to be a servant, really, responsible to the earth. And then if we move down to 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Our identity is that we were made in the image of God. That is who we are. That is who we are to represent. That is our origin. <clears throat> When we look at the commands of what we were to do, we were to be fruitful. We weren't going to go bearing fruit like apples and cherries and bananas and grapes. This echoes the New Testament where there's the fruits of the Spirit. We were to be fruitful 
in the character of God. We were to be more and more showing the character of God. We were given creative power in the image of God. We were to multiply. God made man in his image, and he's Adam and Eve. I want you to make some in your image that are also part of my image. We were given a work or a vocation, a calling. We were to have dominion over all living creatures over the earth. And God's dominion is not one of tyranny, but of service. So if we're in the image of God, we're functioning in the form of service. So we get to hear the Adam and Eve where they have been created in God's image. It's the end of, of Friday daytime, and we're coming to evening. And what does God do first? And he says, I'm going to give you every herb of the sea field and the seeds that eat for you to eat. He's going to feed them. They've been created. They've done nothing. And the first thing God's do is he's going to feed them. Here's everything you can eat. It's right here for you. And then we move into what? The evening and the morning were the seventh day. So God fed them and he put them to bed. He rested them. It's kind of like we do with children. We feed them and we put them to bed. Because if we're going to get ready for a big event... We want them at their best. If they don't get their sleep and they're not fed, they're not at their best. Adam and Eve had done nothing. God provided. He was the giver. He gives. He provides. He serves. He fed. He provided rest. Rest came first. Rest came before they were actively doing their vocation over the dominion of the earth. God's priority was rest, leading to Sabbath and relationship with man. That was God's priority. The reason to engage in the Sabbath as a day of rest and as a day of relationship, the greatest reason is that we have the example that God rested. And when you want a child to do something, you don't tell them, you show them, you live it. Our actions are far greater than our words. God was resting and thus his children were resting. In covenant relationship, that is the imperative and the greatest imperative for the Sabbath. There's no careful, recorded explanation to Adam and Eve at this time that Sabbath was to be kept in one certain way as a day of rest, that it was a day of liberty, that it was a day of worship. That all comes in after the fall when everybody's confused about where they began and who they're supposed to be following. Made in God's image without sin, man had unity of understanding. They were abiding with and in the presence of God. John, chapter 15, 9 and 10, says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. When everybody's abiding in the presence of God and loving as God loves, that all happens naturally, effortlessly. Adam and Eve were in one thought and action with God. They were to grow to be even more so through the minutes, hours, days, and years of Sabbath fellowship. That was the whole point. Education by Ellen White on page 15 says, When Adam came from the creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his maker. God created man in his own image. And it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal this image, the more fully reflect the glory of the creator. All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor were continually to increase. The mysteries of the visible universe, 
The wondrous works of him, which is perfect in knowledge, invited man's study. Face to face, heart to heart communion with his maker was his high privilege. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. Through eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh springs of happiness, and to obtain clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. More and more fully would he have fulfilled the object of his creation. More and more fully would he have reflected the creator's glory. That's what Sabbath was all about. The Sabbath, by design, was to be a continual connection between God and man. It was an expose of God's character of love, delighting, inspiring, teaching, and preparing man to fulfill his God-given purpose of reciprocating and reflecting that love. There's a principle that we see in this idea of creation Sabbath. It's a similar principle that we picked up in Isaiah, and it's a principle we're going to pick up here in the New Testament as well. And that principle is rest, relationship, service. That's the principle, and it's a cycle. God provided rest in a relationship, and that relationship was to be a reflection of him, which is love, which leads to service. Sabbath rest... And this is where my concept of us coming to Sabbath for rest was changed. Sabbath rest at creation was not recuperation from. It was preparation for. I know I am. I think many of us and most of us are. Thank goodness it's Sabbath. I'm exhausted. I need to rest. I am done. It's been the hardest week. There is that now in this state in the world, right? But Sabbath rest in the beginning was not recuperation from. Adam and Eve were not recuperating from anything. They were created. They were fed. They were rested. It was rest in preparation for. God gave rest in preparation for relationship, in preparation for service. When we view Sabbath rest from this perspective, it adds greater dimension to the concept of Sabbath rest, the covenant relationship of creator to created, and our call to service when, within, and like Christ. Because of sin, we now need and crave, crave the rest from work, sorrow, anxiety, guilt, sin, fear, hopelessness, and worthlessness. And God fully provides this rest for us. In Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, he says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If we stop at this rest and seek no further, we lose the dynamic of the creation rest, rest that is the springboard to all we were created to be in covenant relationship with our creator. A rest of recreation, restoring us to his image that our nature, so that our nature becomes but an effortless reflection of his love and glory. There is a rest beyond the rest. In Hebrews 4.9, there is a verse that says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. It's a spiritual rest. And it talks about how the children of Israel, God, the whole point, remember the children of Israel, he was giving them this protection. He was choosing them to reflect his plan of salvation, his plan from creation to all the world. They were the law keepers. But they were to be the law sharers, right? They were to share God's love, his glory. They were to reflect. They were to become more and more like him. That was their job. And they didn't do it so well. And as they're coming out of the wilderness after 40 years of wandering, he's bringing them into the land and he says, 
you know, I'm bringing them to the land of rest, but they're not, I'm not giving them my rest. There was a rest, but there was not the full rest. There was not the spiritual rest because they didn't want it. And I want to focus right now on this concept of rest, this concept of rest to something versus this concept of rest from something. And in doing that, we're going to take our creation picture, our Isaiah picture, and we're going to take our Matthew picture, and we're going to look at some parallels. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. First of all, there's an invitation. We have to come. We have to choose. Secondly, all are invited. There's no exclusion. All may come. Anyone may come. There is rest from labor, as in our works are trying to save ourselves, are trying to be good, are trying to achieve, are trying to succeed. And there's rest from our burdens that we're heavy laden with, our grief, our sorrow, our sin, our guilt, our shame, our despair. The rest is a gift. Come unto me, all you who are laden, and I will give you rest. All we have to do is come. We have to show up. We have to have the voluntary choice, the discipline to come. It's not forced on us. It's there waiting for us as a gift. In creation, Adam and Eve were there. They wouldn't think of not being there, right? They were in harmony with God and man. But in Isaiah, we have this invitation, again, to come back to an original plan. Like the come unto me, we have if you will turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your pleasure on my holy day. There is a discipline in Isaiah of answering the invitation. There's a discipline to rest. Even now, we need to have discipline in how we rest. I tell my patients all the time, uh, they are not sleeping. Well, are you doing this? And have you done this? And have you could do this? And I know all those things, and sometimes I don't do them either because there's the knowledge and then there's the execution, right? So Israel had been given the knowledge. They were having trouble on the execution. We have the knowledge, and yet sometimes we still have trouble on the execution of having a discipline to come and accept the invitation to enter into the rest, The rest, again, is a gift. Come to me and I will give you rest. When we look at the call of Isaiah, when we look at what he's telling them to do, he's saying, turn your foot away from the Sabbath, from doing your own business, your own pleasure on my holy day. Call the Sabbath a delight and a holy day of the Lord. You have to enter the sanctuary of time to get the next part of it. You have to honor what I'm asking you to honor, you have to come to me, and then when you do that, then you're going to delight yourself in me, and I can provide your rest. But the rest is a gift. It's waiting there. We have to be willing to accept it. It's a choice of submission, which was the whole problem to begin with at the fall, as we went from realizing that God was creator and we were created to being tempted as Lucifer was trying to pull everybody into being their own God. It's the same thing we still struggle with today. But there's a second part. There's a second rest. In Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, it says, Take my yoke up on you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke. Again, we have that choice. That submission of will. Nobody's putting a yoke on you. Christ isn't forcing this. He's already giving you the rest. He's invited, if you come to me, I will give you a rest. But there's more he has for you, but it involves your participation. 
It involves your submission, your willingness. So when you take my yoke upon me, you submission of my will, the next step is learn of me. For I am, and you will find rest for your souls. The Sabbath connection was all about learning about Christ, about knowing him more and more, delighting in a relationship with him. And by that, becoming more and more a part of his image. Yoke implies labor. If you're going to put a yoke on, it sounds like work, right? That there might be some labor to it. There might be some active service. And you know what? If you're putting on a yoke, you're not in charge. You're providing other centered service. It's not about you. So could it be that we will find a deeper, more godlike rest and the dynamic rest of creation in active service under the yoke of Christ. Christ who said, of my own self, I can do nothing. I speak only the words the Father gave me. Doesn't this sound like what we're hearing in Isaiah where he's saying, not finding your own pleasures or doing your own ways, not speaking your own words, Is this a parallel to what Christ was already doing and saying? Spurgeon made a comment on this passage and was actually reading his comments that brought me back to thinking about Sabbath rest and this perspective. And he wasn't talking about Sabbath. He was just talking about rest in general. But it was after reading what he said, and then as I was studying all this, that there was all of a sudden this connection of parallels that I started to appreciate. So he makes this comment on the passage of Nashville, and he accurately paints a picture of a typical yoke. And he does, puts it like this. Really, in ancient times, a yoke was designed for animals, for, bursts, for beasts that carried burdens, right? And more often than not, a yoke had two sides so that the weight was distributed between two people or two beasts, two oxen, right? So that they put the yoke on the two oxen and they were united and their movement was together and in tandem. They went forward together. They went backwards together. If they went to the left together, they went to the right together. They moved together, and they rested together. They worked together. There was no separating. They couldn't go apart from each other. They were united, right? A good yoke of oxen knew each other. A good yoke of oxen worked better together than a pair of oxen that had never worked together before because they knew each other. They matched their pace to each other. They matched their strength to each other. They were more effective. So now can you take this this image of the yoke, because Christ so often used images in nature and of the things around him, and can you transfer this imaging to taking on Christ's yoke? Christ carrying out his Father's will, you with Christ under the divine yoke, in active service. Now again, you are in close association with Christ. You are linked with him, giving you an opportunity to learn of me. You're moving together. You're resting together. You're working together. You are once again in harmony. In harmony with our creator. Matthew 30, 11 says, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The call back to Sabbath by Isaiah was a calling of us to be reunited in that harmonious and covenant relationship with the Creator and we being the created. 
He wants to give you a rest, not just from the pain and sorrow of this world, but a rest to fully delight and enjoy the relationship of him. He has a work that he has to do in you, and he has a work that he wants you to do for and with him. And so our Sabbath rest then becomes not so much about, I am finished with this week, but our Sabbath rest now comes of, what does God have for me to do in the week to come? Because now we are empowered and infused and united with him because we've dwelt with him in his presence in his sanctuary of holy time. And it brings us back to where Isaiah says, once we have the yoke, he says, I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Well, we know from creation that God spoke, and it was. When the mouth of the Lord speaks, things happen. So are we not back at the beginning, entering the sanctuary of time, the sacred precinct of Sabbath, fed, rested, and abiding in the presence of God? We can come to the Sabbath and God will give us rest, but he wants us to abide in his presence, and then he will give us rest. At Sabbath, when God created it, He said, it is finished. I have finished my work, and so I'm resting. At Calvary, Christ said, it is finished, and he rested. God is faithful to finish the work he began in you and me, that work of creating us in his image, and now that work of restoring us to his image. And he wants to bring us to finish. The Sabbath tells us where we started. It's the beginning. It gives us the original plan. It gives us our present reality, and it shows us our future delight. The desire of ages, it says, and the Lord says, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. To a hall who received the Sabbath as a sign of Christ's creative and redeeming power, it will be a delight. Seeing Christ in it, they delight themselves in him. The Sabbath points them to the works of creation as evidence of his mighty power and redemption, while it calls to mind the lost peace of Eden. It tells of peace restored through the Savior, And every object in nature repeats the invitation, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God is Sabbathing each and every Sabbath. We have an invitation to join him. Now is the time to delight. Our closing song today is hymn number 86. It's How Great Thou Art. I want to invite you to stand with me as we sing.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for creating us in your image. We thank you even more for sending your Son to restore us to your image, that we might once again Sabbath with you throughout eternity. Lord, as we continue to walk through the pains and the sorrows and the valleys of this earth, that you will be with us, that you will restore us, that you will guide us, that you will rest us, and that we will lead us into your service. And Lord, that we might each and every day greater reflect your love and your glory to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.